Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by InfoPeople. And today, our topic is Demystifying Digitization, an Introduction to California Revealed. And I am now happy to turn the webinar over to our presenter, Pamela Vatican, Director of California Revealed. Thank you, Mary, and hello, everyone. Thank you so much, InfoPeople, for hosting. This is California Revealed's first webinar, so um, I just want you all to bear with me as um, I manage these, <laughs> this new format. Um, our regularly scheduled summer workshops were canceled, so we're trying to substitute our training with this webinar. Um, yeah, so my name is Pamela Vatican, and I'm Director of California Revealed, which is a California State Library funded program that provides free digitization, preservation, and online access to services for cultural heritage collections across the state. And we also give out small grants to support cataloging and community outreach projects, which I'll also talk a little bit about today. So welcome to Demystifying Digitization, a webinar that will introduce you to the California Revealed program and along the way provide general guidelines to help you prepare for any digitization project. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. Usually our workshops are a day long and we only have about an hour and a half together today. So right away, I wanna point out that documentation on the program, additional resources, all the links that I refer to today are live at our website at californiareveal.org. And also I, I wanna say that you know, we'll have an additional half hour today for questions and comments after my presentation. So please save your questions for later. And of course, you know, you can contact me anytime after today. So in case you don't know about our program, we serve a wide range of keepers, collect um, libraries, sorry, we serve a wide range of keepers, librarians, archivists, curators, collection managers, volunteers, and loan arrangers, and all our all our collective partners in the effort to save California history, which as you can imagine is a never ending effort and threatened by backlogs of physically deteriorating materials, poor storage conditions, never ending funding, never enough funding, too few to no staff, and in the case of audiovisual recordings, format obsolescence and scarce playback equipment. I'm sure all of this sounds familiar, and this is just accounting for what is held by institutions. Imagine what treasures are in family closets. We call California Revealed a partnership because we try to meet our partners where they are. Our process is based on best practices in the field, but we try to be practical in our approach to recognizing most organizations have limited resources, and doing something is better than doing nothing. Planning a digitization project is an opportunity to assess the general needs of your collection, identify what is valuable to your community, jumpstart preservation and access, and leverage additional resources. Over the years, we found that the theory of best practice complements good enough practice on the ground. And this afternoon, we'll discuss how to apply these practical practices to your own digitization projects. And of course, California Revealed is here to help you. Um, along the way. So this is just the first of many conversations to come. So I imagine we have a variety of experiences and skill sets here and everyone's in a different place. So to get a sense of where we are as a group, I wanted to take a quick poll. Does your organization have a, a digitization program? And we'll give you about 10 seconds get a sense of who's here. No, yes, in-house. Yes, you're outsourcing the work. Or maybe yes, a combination of both. A little bit in-house, a little bit outsourced. Okay, great. So we have um, most people, well, it's about half and half of not digitizing in-house at all, um, outsourced or in-house, and then mostly in-house, which is great, interesting. 
Um, I do want to say that we we mostly outsource the digitization work that we do. So I will speak mostly to working with vendors, but we will address um, specifications for a digitization program in-house as well. Um, I think the standards apply in, in either scenario. So today we're gonna just briefly um, cover who, who we are, a brief introduction to California Revealed. We'll discuss the opportunities of digitization and how you know, the, the benefits really um, over, overrule the challenges, I think we'll, you'll find. And the real focus of this webinar is to detail the six steps of the digitization process from inventory and assessment to preparation of materials for digitization to digitization standards to quality control of the files to long-term storage and preservation and to online access in the end. Along the way, we'll define roles and responsibilities of our partnership so you can get a sense of how to participate in California Revealed. And at the very end, I'm gonna give you an overview of our timeline for our next grant cycle and hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments. So the California Revealed Collection has actually been around since 2010. And these are just the hard numbers to give you a sense of our growth. Um, we've grown tremendously um, since we first started uploading our first recordings, we uploaded in the spring of 2011. Um, so we're coming up on our 10th anniversary now. And we've steadily been funded by the California State Library, but over the years, we've also received federal funding from NEH um, in 2012, and then again in 2016, and then from 2013, 2015, we were funded with a, by a grant with, um, from IMLS. So we've had a, a combination of state and federal funding, but we're now at this point um, funded annually by the State Library with LSTA funds. And we started digitizing audiovisual collections for the first six years of the program. And then we acquired about a dozen LSTA funded digital projects, including several Shades of California photograph um, collections. Some of you may be familiar with that project. So that's, that's when we started expanding our um, formats to include images and documents. And um, in 2018 is when the state librarian asked us to try a pilot that included all material types. So all, you know, we're basically format agnostic at this point. Um, we're digitizing audiovisual recordings, newspapers, ledgers, scrapbooks, photographs. Um, we really, you know, we appreciate the challenge of esoteric audiovisual formats like wax cylinders and 22 millimeter motion picture film. Uh, we'll, we'll take what, whatever you have, we'll take it as long as it's uh, significant state history. So we'll talk a little bit about um, the selection criteria in a bit. But anyway, as you can see, as we as we added items, we um, we are getting more and more hits, and we're averaging about um, forty two thousand a month. And of course, that went up recently this past month as everyone's sheltering in place. Now, I'm I'm doing all the talking today, but I I wanted to acknowledge that there are actually eight of us, and uh, we also have an active paid internship program where we host at least one student a year. And uh, this year we're processing tens of thousands of objects. Um, we have many in the queue. So the number's always growing, um, what's available online. And uh, once, you, once you go online and see our collections, you'll, you'll see them grow. So please check in and, and see what we've put up recently. So we are um, a program, we're a process. Um, it's a labor and a labor of love. And it's also a partnership. So we have almost 300 partners across the state. This is just a sample of people, A to Z. 
um, wonderful range of collections, including libraries, archives, historical societies, government agencies, um, independent nonprofit production companies. And you can see from the map just how much of the state is not represented by this program. And we know, you know, there are missing stories. There are more places we need to visit with our regional workshops. And there's just so much to discover and make available. And I hope some of you here will, um, will join us in this effort and be on the map. Last, um, California Revealed is, is also, you know, a, a collection of mostly unpublished primary source materials. Um, at this point, we have almost 60,000 objects available online. Um, this is a, quite a rich collection at this point. Um, we have photo albums, scrapbooks, flyers, newspapers, home movies, oral histories. These are just kind of sample images. Um, and and I can add I can send you all links later so you can actually see the objects and explore them. But um, it really is uh, an amazing collection history as it happened, and it and it it's um, there's just a lot of potential for research and reuse, which is an exciting um, benefit of of the program. Kind of like the cherry on top of of our effort to digitize and preserve our history. So why should we digitize? What What is the impetus here? Um, well, we know we can't save everything. Um, digitization is an opportunity to assess the preservation needs of your collection and really kind of be honest and select what is most at risk, what is most valuable, and what is most requested by your community. So it really is like an opportunity to um, move forward with your preservation plan and make a decision. It kind of forces you to decide um, what is most significant to your, your institution, your community. And, you know, preservation requires an explicit commitment of resources. So triage and selection is necessary. And I'm going to kind of guide you through this process um, of, of selecting and assessing in a, in a second. And I didn't want to just tell you why I think, you know, why I think we should digitize and make collections available. Um, we we have partners who have attested to um, the rewards of being part of this process. And just in this could also just speak to their own digitization projects. We have found that many, many people who start participating um, in this program, it's, it usually is a first time experience for them, though that that is changing. I know a lot of a lot of people have have built in-house um, programs, like many of you here. So it really kind of complements, I think, the in-house effort and, and what we're able to outsource. But um, just to kind of give you a sense of what, what people have said, um, one person said, we are able to share recordings that would otherwise not be known by staff or the public. It's also the preservation of California history for the future. Once digitized, we integrate them into the educational experience that the library provides a community of scholars. Greater dissemination of our materials is an excellent benefit, and we gain connections in our community that has helped all of us work together better. We've learned much more about managing or trying to manage digital objects, and it has helped our staff build a case for more investment in digitization projects. So I'm going to go over just the quick um, steps of a basic inventory, assuming that this is a good kind of starting point for those of you who haven't started a digitization program, um, and you need to know what what you have. Um, and I I see the inventory as again another opportunity to know what you have and assess the value and condition as you identify what you have. So the first, the first step um, is that you need to know the extent of what you have and what you want to preserve. 
mean, you, you're not going to be able to get support, you know, financially, institutionally, with your community for, you know, supporting the unknown, you know, the preservation of unknown materials. You have to know what you have and 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 where. And um, again, like I, I think the first step is just identifying and and answering these questions. And really, you know, starting with just even a partial inventory is, you know, is, is a good beginning. You know, you just have to start somewhere. And I would even recommend just using a spreadsheet. You know, don't get caught up in deciding what database software to use. You know, just go with a spreadsheet. You can always import the data later. And um, I would just consider, too, as you're deciding what fields you want to capture, consider your resources available, how much staff times available, and how accurate do you want to be, um, how detailed do you want to be. But generally, um, you can do an item level inventory with a spreadsheet fairly easily if you have, you know, less than 500. You know, just start, start in small batches. And this inventory can naturally feed into our nomination process, which I'll talk about it in a little bit as we go over the fields. And I did want to speak to this idea of determining what is significant so that you can start to triage and select you know, future preservation actions, including digitization. But could also, um, could also think about rehousing, um, perhaps you need shelving. You know, all, all of this data will be useful for other kinds of conservation preservation activities. But, um, when we when we ask people to nominate objects for digitization, we do ask specifically how is the content historically significant, which can really is more about you know significant to your institution, your community. It's it's a very kind of subjective question, which is why I have significant in quotation marks because that's not really up to us to de define. It's really up to you all. So. We just, you know, these are just kind of prompts, like, to kind of add value to the object. Is it historically significant? Do people request the object? Is it part of a comprehensive collection? Ideally, would you want to digitize the whole collection? It's kind of the arc of this dream. If lost, and this is, of course, a kind of a weird question, but if you're trying to kind of add some sort of financial kind of value to the object, would your library or archives send resources to replace it with kind of assuming it's replaceable? Um, you know, a lot of most of your collections are unique. So it's kind of a weird question, but you can kind of think about, well, would it be worth the institution to replace it if they could? I also like to add considerations for um, copyright because usually if it's non-commercial, out of copyright, public, but public domain material, it's, it's lower hanging fruit for digitization, so you don't need to worry as much um, about potential, you know, conflicts or, um, you know, people contesting uh, use, but I, I would just, we're going to talk about rights in a little bit, but I, I think that that's, it's something to consider, like if you know the copyright status of an object, then that's, that's a good um, way to kind of move forward and know that it's safe to make it available online. And last but not least, is it your responsibility, which of course is not, not the, uh, could be a complicated question too. And as you're assessing value, at the same time assess condition. And this is, this really is about the physical material. Um, just consider, is this unique archival material, is it the master? And or is it the best available, which a lot of times um, in the audiovisual world, um, you might have a copy of something, but it might be extremely rare. So it's, it's a good candidate for digitization. Obsolescence is always um, a consideration, particularly for audiovisual recording. Um, basically, if it's analog, it's endangered. Um, magnetic media in um, particular is extremely um, fragile and um, I would say that the window 
has closed, if not, you know, if it hasn't closed yet, it's closing, um, to really transfer those. You need to transfer the magnetic media formats as soon as possible. It's getting harder and harder to find that playback equipment. And um, yeah, is it damaged or deteriorating? So this is, I would just think of like red flag scenarios, like is it falling apart? Is it moldy? Does it smell like vinegar? Um, questions like that, just kind of add a little asterisk in your inventory. And if it's a, if use continues, is it at risk? For instance, are you playing back audio cassette tapes that might get damaged in the, the tape player? So these are the essential fields that I would start with when you're doing an inventory. And these are the required fields for California Revealed. So um, it's fairly simple, just whatever information you capture, you could submit um, as a nomination for the program. And I, I think that this really is a good start. Um, again, format and condition and extent information is really important for budgeting purposes, for approximating digitization costs, file data storage costs, um, and, and of course just knowing like what you have um, in terms of quantity. And then, um, you know, the other kind of more descriptive information, title, call number, created date creator, and significance description, those are all more for like your um, own kind of content, you know, just to know like what the content is and of course help you decide if it's important or not. So the, the significance and the condition fields, I think, are what you should use to triage. Um, and if you don't know, you can always say unknown, that's fine. And um, kind of leave a placeholder until you have the time to get back to those questions. But really, I would just start with these basic fields, you know, when you're in, in the stacks or your um, storage. Um, so uh, encourage field. So this is more like extra credit. <laughs> um, and we we are asking for this information. It's not required, but it's really to just more to enhance discoverability for your users. And also um, as we push out records to various platforms, adding more metadata and, and having more linked terms um, can really kind of connect you to other collections, um, other types of users. So, and again, this is more about the content and, um, you know, many cases you might have something that's not labeled or you just don't, you just don't know with audiovisual recording. Sometimes it's just a film reel and that's all you know. But if you do know anything about the content, this is a good opportunity to add these, um, to add this information, or you can always add it after digitization. And I wanted to plug our cataloging, our processing cataloging mini grant. Um, we have this little mini grant. It, it funds up to $5,000 for a small um, processing cataloging project um, with the intent that in the end, it'll help you nominate objects for digitization so uh, we do ask for up to 200 records um, after that grant ends to you know just submit those records as nominations but um, we have people um, you know creating finding aids with this grant it actually covers supplies for rehousing so it, it really is a nice opportunity to address your backlog and we offer that every spring so we just gave out those awards um, but I would look out for that next year. So you have all your, um, you have your lovely inventory and you filled it out to the best of your ability. You've made your final selection. Let's say you start with 25 items you'd like to digitize. And it's now time to prepare the materials for digitization. Now, I add this as a step because in many cases, um, sometimes we've, you know, we, we often work with unprocessed collections or collections where um, 
the record that we have on hand through this kind of nomination process is like an, a, the first kind of catalog record. So we really, um, we, we really want people to kind of take out the items from storage and prep them and get them ready for digitization. And again, this is something that, you know, you'll need to do for your own um, in-house setup. And we've just found that, you know, organization is key, um, you know, putting together related items in the case of um, film or video that may have multiple reels. Uh, we're also able to digitize on a folder level. So you might have um, a bunch of loose clipping files, for instance, in a folder. So we would want you to, you know, make sure those clippings are in one, you know, folder. They're all organized uh, nicely in the order you want them to be scanned. And we really want you, um, ideally, this is part of your selection process, even as you're doing the inventory, if you come across copies, if you have the time to identify the kind of the highest resolution, that's really what is ideal for digitization, because you want the highest resolution possible. So, for instance, you'd want to you know, choose negatives over prints. Um, and if there are multiple prints, you'd want to pick the best copy. And, you know, as your, th these are more like steps for us, but I think it probably would help your own in-house setup too, is to make sure you have that call number or temporary identifier clearly on the item. And you can use that identifier to, to name your files as you're going along. So that's a, a good thing to have on reference. And we do recommend using your acid-free tape, like artist tape, painter's tape, for labeling items with that identifier. And um, we also ask, you know, just to tape down loose uh, film pieces, like the, the end of the film reel, um, the end of audio tape reels. Um, this is actually good practice just for long-term storage as well. So just make sure everything's secure. and. Don't, you know, don't use post-it notes, like make, make sure you use the tape. And then we're also asking, you know, just when you're shipping materials to us to add your organization's name and box number, um, use bubble wrap. And we have shipping guidelines available, um, just general guidelines. But these are kind of like the kind of the checklist that we usually give people to remind them of what, what we'd like to see when we get the mail. So I imagine this could be its own webinar, digitization standards, and we don't have tons of time today. Um, but I'm going to try to get through kind of the considerations you should think about as you're putting together a statement of work, which could be, you know, a statement for your own organization, um, as well as, you know, just as for the vendor. So um, when you're putting together the statement of work, it's documentation of your process, your standards, and it's what you'll send out to vendors to get bids on your project. So you need to be very clear about what you want and what you expect. And um, and I, I have questions here just kind of about if you, if you want to set up in-house or outsource the work, because we do get this question a lot. We actually question it ourselves for our own practice. Um, we recently set up a camera in-house to do, to um, accommodate more fragile collections. Um, but, you know, the, the con of that is that, you know, it, it's a big investment and it does require a full-time staff person. I mean, this, our, our person happens to be full-time, but it, you definitely need some dedicated staff time to run the camera. And, you know, if you are setting up transfer equipment for audiovisual recordings, that's, that's real time where you're going to have to sit with the recording, you know, play it back um, and capture the recording in its, in its entirety. So it, it's, it's real time, real, real time. And, uh, but the pros of that are, you know, it's, you have total control of the process. Um, you're, you're minimizing handling and shipping. Um, you, you can, sit there with the collections, you know exactly what you're getting in the end. And it really is an opportunity to develop new skills in uh, digitization practices. So I, I definitely think that there's advantages to an in-house setup. Um, for outsourcing, you lose the control, but a big 
uh, well, a lot of pros, I guess, are like less investment of resources, equipment, and staff. So you don't have that real-time factor. I mean, there's definitely time prepping and, and doing quality control. I mean, you, you can never get rid of that part of the process, but um, in terms of just the actual digitization work, um, you know, can be sent, you know, to the vendor who has, you know, the trained staff on hand, the protocols, the standards. It's, it's just easier to send it all out to them. And it's great, too, if a lab can handle a majority of formats, a major, you know, a majority of um, particular kinds of materials. Um, so for us, we tend to have a lab that handles most of our audiovisual recordings and then a lab that handles most of our print materials. So that's usually how we distribute the work. And you want to consider in your statement of work file specifications. And I, I can't go into the details and nitty gritty, but in general, you want to create a preservation master, which is a high quality, highest resolution possible, uncompressed master. You want to capture it as it is. And for the access file, I mean, I, I recommend stream quality so that you, you know you can put it online. But um, you also might want to consider other types of use. Um, and I, that really depends on your institution. If you want to make something that's maybe broadcast quality or publication quality, you might want to make a mezzanine level um, master sort of in between the uncompressed and the compressed version. Um, it's, it's really up to you. But you want to choose a file format that's open source or widely adopted. You also want to consider metadata and metadata standards. So you want to think about all the information that you have about the object, like that descriptive information you captured during your inventory. You want to gather that along with all the technical information about the digitization process, any administrative notes that you might want to add, um, such as condition notes or um, notes about about you know who you're doing, who's doing the work, um, who's doing the digitization, um, and then in the end, preservation metadata. So that's information about um, the process and then the final files. So you know exactly the file formats, the checksums, all of that information should go into a, a machine-readable kind of XML record is ideal map to these particular schema, Dublin Core or PB Core. There's, there's lots of metadata schema out there, but these are pretty common. And we, we use Dublin Core for the print materials and PB Core for the audiovisual materials. So you just want to choose, again, an open, open source schema. And um, these are two that I recommend. They're pretty easy um, to map to. And generally, you want to think about your file naming conventions. Um, you know, use that unique identifier, be consistent. And this is just an example of using, you know, adding the date um, of the work and maybe the series title, or you could use the main title there, and then followed by a unique sequential number. Um, and this is, this is gathered from Stanford University's recommendations, which I'll link to later. And you also want to think about data storage um, because ideally, you know, you want to have redundant storage, at least two copies. And you'll want to tell, um, you'll want to decide what kind of storage media you want the files delivered on. Um, so, yeah, I can send you kind of da data storage estimates too, but I, I, it really depends on the kind of files that you have. For instance, a, a video kind of object can be about 100 gigs per hour. And then you can have like a microfilm collection, a whole you know, newspaper series that ends up being about 174 megabytes. So it really, it can really vary. And it really depends on what you're scanning. 
but you need to get a sense of the requirements of kind of what you're going to end up in the end, end up with in the end. And then last but not least, um, when you're putting together your statement of work, you're, you're going to want to know what the final cost is for the, the, for the digitization as well as the storage. And, you know, any vendor, if you're working with a vendor, any vendor can help you with this process and crunching the numbers. Um, and then, of course, you want to be clear about your timeline because that will be the basis for your, your contract. I just wanted to show you an example of um, a couple of objects in our collection just to give you a sense of, of how we're doing it. Um, of course, it totally depends on your own situation, but um, what we ended up doing <clears throat> excuse me, is use um, a mark, the MARC organization code from the Library of Congress for each partner. So that's what that CWATS, that stands for the Watsonville Public Library. And 000006 is the unique object identifier for this photograph of Alicia Ramirez in Watsonville at a birthday party with her kids. And you can see here what we ended up doing was we created um, an uncompressed TIFF, which is um, toward the bottom there, along with, um, so that's our preservation master, along with um, an access copy, JPEG copy. And we created checksums for each file, which is a unique um, kind of thumbprint, I guess, for that digital file. And if the file ever changes, the checksum will change. So we use that checksum to make sure that the files remain the way that they are, the way that we receive them. And if they ever end up becoming corrupt, if a bit flips or something happens during migration, we'll know because the checksum will fail and we'll have to replace that file from our other copy. So that's, that's why we have those checksums. They're very important. Make sure you get them. And um, last but not least, we have that XML metadata record. So that's, that's an example of a photograph. And then this is what we're doing for newspapers. This is um, from the Yolo County Archive, Knight's Landing News from 1859. And this is actually a scan from a microfilm collection. And, uh, you know, so it's a little, it's basically all that we could get. This is the only surviving copy of this title. And you can see um, what we ended up doing is we're creating a preservation, you know, quality TIFF for each page. And then we're making a bound object, a PDF for the access copy. And then we have checksums for each file along with our metadata. So you can see that that's, um, kind of how we're structuring it for newspapers. So I didn't want to just leave you without specifics and, and resources, and I will email these out after the webinar so you have them handy, but I do encourage you all to look at our statement of work. So you, you know, you're welcome to copy, pull whatever language you like from our statement of work if you're doing your own projects. And that gives you a sense of what we're doing. Um, if you end up participating, you'll know what kind of deliverables you'll get in the end. Um, and I just have additional resources, a digitization guide for print materials. If you're, if you're setting something up in house, um, those just kind of give you guidelines according to the Library of Congress, which is my next resource cited here. And then last, um, it's Stanford University's file naming recommendations, which are really helpful. So once you've done all the scanning and the files are back or you, you're ready to, to move forward, um, it's time to do quality control. And this is really essential because um, this is your, your digital collection. You want to make sure you did it right and um, your true, you know, your capture is as true to the original as possible. So when we do quality control, this is what we're doing. I mean, we're running scripts to make sure the files meet our technical specifications. So that's all automated. And then it gets more into kind of the human element here of QC, where you have to double check that the files are named correctly, that you know the folders are named correctly, the directory structure is correct. We open up that XML metadata file and make sure that the metadata matches the object and it's what we supplied to the vendor and, and it's what we're getting back. 
And then we run the checksums to make sure the files are true and and good, um, what we expect them to be. They haven't changed. Um, this is really, this really kind of speaks more to at the point of capture, you know, the files are moving from one system to another. Sometimes they're going from, you know, a desktop situation to a server, to a drive, to another drive, and potentially, you know, the files could change. So it really is important to run those checksums when you first get the deliverables and and send back anything that doesn't check out because it's really not worth your time to, to continue with quality control if the files are corrupt in some way. And you want to assess um, the image and our sound quality. So this is really where like the human element comes in, the labor and the labor of love that I like to say, where you really have to spend time with the object. And we do 100% at first. And then we'll sample when justified, which, so we'll go to 50%, go down to 30%. Um, it really depends on the nature of the collection. If it's a uniform collection, uniform formats, condition, um, it's, it's easier to just sample, of course. Um, but if, if you end up finding an error, we always go back to 100% because we want to make sure that we aren't missing anything, any problems, and the vendor needs that feedback. Or, you know, in the case of for our in-house setup, the technician needs that feedback. And of course, we're checking if 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 content is missing, if um, if an item's cut off or cropped or skewed, you know, questions like that. And then this is what we um, ask of partners. And again, this is this is where you all would come in if you participate. And especially if we are sampling, ideally you would check 100% of all files. And we're really asking you to check if the quality is adequate for patron use. So you're looking at the access versions online and um, you know, noticing if anything is glaringly like terrible, if it's illegible or unlistenable, we would want to know. Um, but you're not expected necessarily to look at the preservation masters and assess the highest resolution. It's more about access at this point. And then of course, we want you to confirm that the content matches the description so there aren't any surprises and and if there are surprises please update the metadata we ask you to add the description directly in our repository which is islandora system um, but we can also do it through a spreadsheet too if that's easier um, as a batch so only after we've approved the files you've approved the files will the vendor return the original materials to the archive we want everyone to be happy in the process So this is the kind of the part that people don't really think about, um, but I, I think it's really important to plan um, for storage and preservation. We don't want to lose these precious files, all this work that goes into the process. So I, I just wanted to get a sense, I wanted to do a little poll here for those of you who have files in-house, whether you've acquired them, um, you know, or you've, you've created the files, through your own um, digitization efforts or your, your outsourcing that works. So just give me a sense of how you're storing files. So we're gonna launch this poll and it's only gonna be, again, about 10 seconds just to get a sense of your efforts and your needs here. So how is your organization currently storing files? And Please select, you know, all of the options, all that apply, and don't don't be shy. I mean, I think, you know, I I wanted to put here, you know, your phone or something, but um, it really is more kind of about your organization's storage capacity and what you're able to do. All right, could we go back to that poll? Can you all see it? Oh, we're showing the results right now. Can you see it? Oh, them? you are, okay. Okay, I do, yeah. So it looks like, I'm trying to see here, about 42%. 
you're storing files on a local desktop or laptop, so local computer. And then followed by some of the most popular is hard drives. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's true for most of our partners as well. And then we have, we have the cloud, which is great. I'm glad people are starting to explore that because the, the data um, storage costs online have gotten cheaper. So it's great people are, are trying that out. And I, I think we have a lot to learn from each other and that, with that experience too. Great, thank you. So we store our files currently on LTO tape, which is, you know, very high density computer, you know, data tape. Um, and we do, we do find that to be relatively affordable because um, we can store, I think the latest version can store, uh, oh gosh, I don't have that data handy, but many, many terabytes. Um, and it's, we run those checksums every year. So what we've been doing is, um, again, we have that technical metadata, all of that metadata is stored with a digital object. And the idea is that the future people could open up those files. Um, they can open up the technical metadata and know what those objects are um, and, and know how they were created and what their needs are, if there are any file format obsolescence issues, for instance. Um, so that's, that's important to have on, on the tape. And we store it all together um, in a folder so that the metadata is always there with the content. Uh, as, as technology changes, we'll have to migrate those files to the next generation of LTO tape. Um, and you know, as we move to the cloud, uh, we want to be sure that the content and the description about the content goes together. We have um, two geographically dispersed copies. So we have a copy in Sacramento at the State Library and a copy in Ohio, you know, at, at a cave in a mountain. And um, the idea being, you know, if if a file fails or if the tape fails, we can always go to that other copy and replace the bad copies. And we do check some validation annually. We restore the files if something fails. And then, of course, we have to continuously migrate to the next format. So at this point, you know, we started on LTO five, and we're now moving to eight, which just came out this year. And that's an inevitability. Um, as you all know, you have to continuously think about how your files are stored and how old they are and how, how old's the drive. You want to be sure that the files are are safe and active. And so these are just basic tips that we tell partners and uh, we do find that most people are getting copies. That wasn't a requirement initially, but most people are keeping the copies, which is great. And we are not recommending the optical discs at this point because of um, just the issues of the discs themselves. They're very fragile. They're easily scratched. And it is harder to find disk drives these days. So really just stick with hard drives at this point. Um, label and organize the hard drives. Use that painter's tape, that artist tape again, to give your hard drive a unique identifier. Um, and then I would um, duplicate the files on a second drive or upload to the cloud, as some of you all are doing. So that's, that's great. Um, but you want to be sure you have two copies at least. And if you have access to server storage, that's ideal. Um, if you do have a real kind of hard drive backup in-house, that's that's great, that's networked. But I know a lot of people don't have access to that kind of storage, but I, I just want to mention that too. If you have it, then that's great. That's another backup. And there are free tools out there to check checksums. Um, we recommend Fixity. We also have an in-house script that we have up on our GitHub that you're welcome to use. It's open source, very easy to use. Um, it creates and checks checksums. So please feel free to use those tools. And definitely check the checksums every year and access the files every year. Just make sure the hard drive is okay. 
um, specifically, but then even when on the cloud, you want to be sure those files are okay and they're fixed. And this is another suggestion just to add a text file on the hard drive that's an inventory of the files and update, update that, um, that text file as well. So, for instance, we have a, a manifest of all of our files on our LTO tape. And that includes, um, you know, a list of every single file on every single tape, including the checksum files. So, uh, you know, it constantly has to be updated, but it's important to know what you have. And again, here's some resources because we don't have that much time together. So I just wanted to be sure that you can consult those really excellent guides out there. So access, this is kind of like the purpose of preservation and digitization. Um, there are just so many rewards um, to connect with your communities, connect with your users. Um, of course, we are online. Um, so this is just a glimpse of our, our website. Um, this website just came out last year. Um, we were uploading everything, and we still are uploading everything to the Internet Archive, but this is our public um, portal at this point, our public face. And we're starting to develop themes and exhibits, and we're pushing our metadata. We've, we've always been doing this since the beginning out to WorldCat, Calisphere, the Digital Public Library of America, and the Home Movie Registry, just to broaden exposure, um, reach as many users as we can. Um, and so that, that can lead to um, online exhibits on those other portals as well, which is kind of another, another bonus. And I just wanted to give you some examples of um, how some people are building exhibits out of their collections, which I think is kind of the biggest, um, I guess the most popular activity for online collections. Um, this is an example of an exhibit hosted by Emeka from the Center for Sacramento History. And uh, they're linking to this from their own website. And then this is another example of an online exhibit hosted by Scalar, which is a open source um, exhibit software developed by the University of Southern California. We're actually starting to explore Scalar this year, and we're hoping to work with partners too to to put together exhibits on different themes. And this is just, this is an example from the University of California, Los Angeles's Ethnomusicology Archive. And they had kind of an interactive component where they asked for community submissions. So it's just kind of a great example of what, what you can do once collections are available. And then last is um, the California State Archives online exhibit example. This is actually hosted by Google Arts and Culture which is kind of a nice, it has a nice kind of clean design, um, which I like. Um, and we're hoping that we can do some, we can have more partnerships with Google to do more exhibits like this. And then another example is Calus here, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And especially now there's just such a hunger for um, teaching resources, online teaching resources. And Calisphere has um, a particular um, portal for educators, and those primary source sets are built from these various exhibits. So um, there's just a lot of opportunity. I think one nice advantage for for our partners is as we're pushing metadata out to Calisphere and then you know onto the Digital Public Library of America, potentially California histories can be you know integrated into these, or I should say local histories can be integrated into these larger kind of statewide national stories um, that are being told on these other other platforms. So it's it's a nice way to not only get your collections out there but then collaborate with others. So this is only just like some examples of other outreach models beyond um, beyond exhibits. Um, the LAS Subject Archives Bazaar is is quite an event, quite popular as you can see by this 
photographs. And a lot of people come out to archives, um, fairs, or crawls. And um, it's just, you know, I've seen people set up little iPads or a computer so that people can see their digital collections, um, or they can, they'll have maybe a bunch of oral histories up and a listening station. I mean, there's lots of ways you can do it. Um, but it's a kind of a nice way to, to get out there and of course meet your, your neighbor archives and libraries. The community history map is, is another example that I love that came out of the Oakland history room, um, collaboration with, um, the East Bay, uh, getting East Bay yesterday is the name of the, the organization. And, um, what they ended up doing was, taking items from the history room and putting them on a history map. And it was like a walking tour of Oakland, which is really, really great. And if you, if you follow that link, you'll see it's like quite colorful and engaging. Home Movie Day is um, another kind of more like a community digitizing, um, kind of a personal digital archiving initiative, um, both access and digitizing where people bring in home movies. And some events actually do scanning at the events. And it's an opportunity for families to bring in their home movies, share them with each other, with the community, get preservation, conservation advice, um, transfer advice um, for their incredibly um, precious films, you know, unique, one of a kind home movies, and then um, and then share them. And it's just a really lovely kind of community event. Um, and I've I've just seen kind of people kind of feed into the home movie day by showing collections or home movies they've digitized, and then it ends up becoming like a, a call for content, which is similar to the memory lab idea too, which I also have a link up um, as kind of another means to promote community archiving and digitizing and connect your collections with the community. So this, these are open labs um, where people can come in after training and scan their collections on their own. and um, you know, with the family's permission, the institution or the hosting organization would get copies of the files. And California Revealed starting to um, build out a program to support those memory labs. And um, that's going to happen this next year, which, or I should say, yeah, next, next year, 2020, 2021. That'll be a new um, little grant program we're going to have. But um, the currently, um, we have a a mini grant program for community outreach. And that's, um, that link right there will, will kind of, that's, again, that's a spring grant and that'll help support initiatives like these. Um, and then there are other examples on that, on that page, kind of other ideas like, you know, curriculum development or artist commissions or living history events. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can utilize your collections and, and have people engage with their content which we encourage. So very quickly, I, I just wanted to go over our timeline for next year in case those of you want to participate and you feel ready to assess, inventory, dive in, and start selecting items for digitization. We tend to frame this program, um, at least this, this part of the process of nomination time, as a summer project. Um, currently, the application is open now, so you're willing, you know, you're you're able to apply tonight if you'd like. Our form is up, and um, we can sign you up for an account if you want to nominate directly in Islandora, or we have a spreadsheet form available, which can usually be easier, especially if you have that inventory in a spreadsheet. You can just map to our spreadsheet. Um, or we can take the spreadsheet and map it or, you know, import it into Islandora. So either way will work. And we are accepting up to 200 nominations. Now that's individual objects. And we really leave it up to you to define what an object is. So in the case of folders, which I mentioned, if you have a bunch of loose clippings or photographs in a folder, you would count that as an object. Um, it doesn't really matter how many pages are in that folder, um, we would just take it as, you're, as you've arranged it, if that makes sense um, from a user's perspective too. If that, if that works, um, it, you know, from an archivist user's perspective, it should be fine. And um, 
the other exception I should say to the 200 is newspapers. So ideally we want to digitize a full run. So you would just submit the title of a, of a, a newspaper run. And again, it doesn't matter how many pages, um, we would just want to do as much as we can. Um, you could count that as one and then you can nominate 199 film reels if you want. Um, it, we just want to know, you know, kind of what's most important. You let us know. And technically we can only award up to 200 nominations, but this isn't meant to discourage you from nominating more than that if you are on a roll and you have a, an inventory of those 500 items or more, um, just feel free to nominate as much as you'd like and then we'll just add it to the queue because there's always next year. And it, it's good to have it you know, on our radar so we can plan for that next year with our, with our budgeting. So I, we say up to 200, we try to make this manageable, but you're encouraged to nominate more if you'd like. So we tend to um, send award letters out in the fall before the holidays so that you have time to prep you know your materials get them ready for shipping to us in Sacramento at the State Library so we give you a little bit of time and we tend to um, give you deadlines that are kind of based on our own digitization schedule so um, we usually ask for batches and it, it really depends on um, the formats and the conditions. We try to figure out that schedule and then we'll add the date to your award letter and you have some time to then prep and ship everything to us. Um, we start sending the materials out to the vendors. So at this point, we've already sent our statement of work, you know, to the vendors and we have, you know, their bid in hand. We know what, what we're going to do, what we plan to do based on the award letters that we sent. And that's our plan for the year. And we'll start to send materials to the vendors again in batches. It's really kind of first come first serve, depending on our shipping schedule. And what we end up doing is, you know, upon check-in is we double check everything you've sent us using your inventory, your shipping letter. And we double check the metadata. We'll double check condition notes. I mean, we, we are depending on you to, to give us as much information as you have. But we're also kind of double checking too before we send everything off to the vendor to account for every piece, um, every film reel, um, every every piece of metadata will standardize and, and send that on to the vendor. And the vendor has about a six month period of digitization. Again, they're returning files to us in batches as they're receiving the collection. And by spring, we're QCing and uploading the access files for partners to then help us with the QC process. And, you know, you can see that what ends up happening every year is we're processing and QCing simultaneously. So um, those two activities are, are constantly happening throughout the year. And as we approve the files, as you approve the files, you can then um, order copies of the files if you like and we'll get copies on LTO, sign off on the work, and then the originals come back to you, ideally by the end of the summer. So it's like a full year cycle, but that's assuming that there's no rework and that everything is, you know, simple, which doesn't always happen. So, you know, we say August is the ideal, but that, that doesn't always happen. Um, so just to give you a sense of kind of the, the time it takes for this to happen. And then we also want you all to start thinking about the fall um, next year and planning um, community outreach events and promoting your online collections because that really is an important step of, of this work is letting people know what you have available and, and connecting with people. So that's pretty much the end. Um, I We have a little bit of time for questions and comments. We have about 25 minutes or so, which is great. Um, thank you for hanging in there. We usually, I know these webinars are usually an hour, but I wanted to give us time for questions and comments because I really miss the interactivity of our workshops. And I'm curious if you all have specific questions about 
our workflow or general questions about the process? Pamela, we had one question come in um, uh -huh. when you were talking about the scanning process. And someone yeah. asked, could you tell us something about adding the object ID to the scan? I assume the one with the ID is the preservation copy? The, one, the identifier. So when you're doing the scanning, you would add that identifier to the actual file name when you're doing the scanning. And then another step that we take is we embed that file with that identifier, as well as the title and the institution name. So in the end, you would have a file that's this actual file is named with that identifier, and then you would have that information embedded. And of course, that identifier is in the metadata as well. So that's all, that really is kind of like the name tag for the object is the identifier. And you would do that for all of the files. So um, I can go back to that particular, those two particular examples where we had a photograph. So you can see that the identifier is the foundation for all of the files. And we end up adding, you know, access as a label for the access copy, metadata for the metadata, and then PRSB stands for the preservation master. Okay. And if that person had a follow-up, they can go ahead and you can ask that now. And we did have another question come in. Great. How do you handle digitizing a huge collection of bound newspapers? We have a huge collection, which is very old and musty. Mm -hmm. That sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, we, yeah, we, well, the, the binding is definitely a question. So we prefer not to disbound. Um, we prefer not to do any, you know, we, we prefer not to damage or, you know, change the object in any way, um, of course. And just finding, you know, they're definitely, I wouldn't call it damage, but it's, you know, it's changing the object. And I know some people are uncomfortable by that, especially if it's tightly bound. So when people are nominating non, um, newspapers, we ask about the nature of the binding and can it open 180 degrees? You know, we can accommodate bound materials using a book cradle, but um, but it might have to be disbound. It really depends on if, you know, if you can see the text, if it's in the gutter and you're, you know, you want to avoid that bend of the text because then the OCR can't pick it up, um, you know, we'll have to disbind. But in that case, you know, if there's any kind of repair or treatment needed, we always ask for permission, obviously. And there could be additional costs too, uh, so we might, you know, we might need to ask for your permission to approve those additional costs that the institution would have to cover. But um, we really try to avoid disbinding if we can. And as for mustiness, um, I think that that's a good thing for to note in terms of um it being a preservation priority because it is actively deteriorating if it's brittle falling apart we would want to know that when you nominate the item not only because it it kind of bumps it up in terms of like a higher priority for preservation but that means that it might need you know extra care and handling in the process and you know we would want to be aware of that and the vendor would want to be aware of that it, it does affect cost so we would want to know all of kind of the conditions of the material. So that's why it's important when you're doing that initial inventory to let us know kind of what the conditions like. It, it, it helps with triage and then it helps, it helps you plan for future handling and, and digitization. Okay, and another question. From what I understand, once the files are digitized, California Revealed has a 100% copy and the partner would have a 100% copy. As for the copy sure. that California Revealed has on their server, 
does the partner mm -hmm. have access to the server to stream mm -hmm. the content to their own website? Hmm. So what we end up doing is we store the files. Yes, yeah, so you're correct. The partner, yeah, everyone, all parties get copies of the files. We're storing the preservation masters, the object, on offline, actually, on data tape. So we don't touch the preservation masters. The only copy that's available technically online is that access copy, that streaming co copy. So what we end up doing is we upload that access copy to the Internet Archive, which, by the way, is totally free. And you would get copy, you know, you get access to that collection so you can upload other objects if you like beyond California Revealed. You can do that. And once you have access to the back end of that online collection, you can download access copies from the Internet Archive directly if you'd like. Um, that, that really is like the only access point. Otherwise, um, for preservation masters, you know, you would have, ideally, you would keep copies of that, those masters. And then if, in case you did need a backup or something happened, if, if you needed a copy from us, we can pull copies from the LTO tape. Okay, and I think this is a little bit of a follow-up from that same person. Is all the content okay. automatically available on the California Revealed site, or is there a way to scaffold access? Everything is available. So to that end, you know, when you're making, when you're putting together your list of nominations, you're automatically asking that question, is this okay to make it accessible? So. Um, I mean, we, we do come across surprises, and there have been cases where, due to privacy concerns, people have wanted to take items down. Um, we've actually never had a copyright claim, so I think that's encouraging. Um, over the past 10 years, and we've, we're reaching about 60,000 objects, we've had no rights issues. It's more just a privacy concern. So, or, you know, um, yeah, like a surprise, something maybe misidentified. It's not what you thought it would be. And it's maybe not even California history or you just don't want to make it available. We can take we can take stuff down. That's not a problem. If there's ever an issue, we can take it down. But in general, we don't limit access. At the beginning, we, we want it to be open. And that's the intention of the project. We, our aim is to digitize as well as make it available. Okay. We have some audio and video tapes where the labels have fallen off or there's very little information about what is on the tape. We cannot play the tapes because we do not have the equipment. How do we find out what is on them to be able to nominate them? Mm -hmm. Well, we discourage playback as much as you may be tempted to just because the tape mechanisms could be deteriorating and you really risk damaging the tape. And we just don't want that to happen. I mean, we really want attempted at playback to happen when we're actually digitizing. So we end up accepting a lot of unknowns in this program. Like, you know, we say these fields are required. We want a title, we want a creator, we want a date. That really is the ideal, but we accept unknown as a placeholder until after digitization. And that's really when I guess the real work comes into play. So, you know, I, I do encourage you to submit your mysteries because we are used to the mysteries. We'll take them. If there's some sort of connection, um, you know, think about context for that object. Um, if there is some sort of connection to state, local, regional history, um, you know, take your best guess. We'll still take it. You know, we, we're okay with blank situations. Like, it's happened. Um, you just do what you can. I mean, we, because we started off as an audiovisual preservation project, we're so used to that situation where, you know, labels dry out and you'll open up a box and it'll just be like a can of, a box of cans and then a pile of labels. <laughs> like, and then you have to kind of piece them together, you know, if you can. Um, but 
you know, that's, we're really, we're used to that. And, and with magnetic media, there's, you really can't do anything about it. You know, all you have is that tape. Um, with film, the nice thing about film, especially picture film, is that if you get a light box and a loop, you can actually, you know, unwind it and look at the first few frames and maybe identify the film that way. Um, but with, with magnetic media, you're, you're definitely left with kind of unknowns you just have to live with. What is your view on mass digitization versus curated digitization? Um, it's an interesting question because I think some people would call California Revealed a mass digitization project, but at the same time, we're depending on cure, you know, the, the partners to curate and, and carefully select what's most important to them. Um, I think ideally, the archivist's dream is to digitize on a series level, on a collection level, and save everything. But I don't think that that's realistic, given our limited resources and just the demand. You know, everyone has collections in need, and there's we're talking about millions and millions and millions of objects, and the costs are quite high for digitization. So. I, I see why, you know, mass digitization in theory, it, it sounds like a great idea, but, but practically speaking, I just, I feel like selection is inevitable. It's a copyright question. Um, oh, good. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you have materials from an author in a typescript or handwritten form, of an article that was later published, how does that work with copyright? And we're digitizing a handwritten note that was later published, that's the question? Yeah, I believe that's it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you'd have to go to the publisher and see when, when it was copyrighted by the publisher and then kind of work backwards. If you have the creator's um, co you know, contact information. I don't know how old this item is, but if you have access to gaining permission from the original author to digitize and make it available, that can override the publisher's rights. But really, I think traditionally, um, it goes to the publisher and they usually have copyright for so many years. And Copyright, of course, is its own webinar, and, and I didn't get into the nitty-gritty um, of, of copyright, but, but generally, you know, once something's published, you have to defer to the publishing rights, and that, that's a reason why we tend to lean toward unpublished archival collections, because we don't usually have to deal with that. I mean, newspapers have really challenged us in many ways because we're having to go to microfilm publishers now and consider consider that right as well um, of like filming a, a newspaper run makes it kind of another right situation so it we're we're working with published materials but for the most part we try to steer away from them only because of this issue Um, can scrapbooks with community history photos and information be nominated for scanning? Yes. <laughs> I love scrapbooks. Yes, please. And scrapbooks are fun because there's so many pieces and, and they're just so special. So we tend to do those in-house with our in-house camera. And in that case, you know, we would treat the scrapbook, all the pages, all the pieces as one object. And we would work really closely with you to let us know how you want to represent that object and all of its pieces. Because what we're trying to do, if, if, you go, if you go online, you'll see that we're trying to kind of replicate the user experience of, you know, handling the physical material as close as we can get. And the scrapbooks are challenging because there are, you know, it's interactive. You know, there's lots of layers. You might want to unfold something and then look at look at that piece carefully. So what ends up happening is we make this bound object, but 
will sometimes capture the layout, will capture the, you know, when you first open the book as you're actually experiencing it. And then we would deep, we dive into each little piece so that you can explore each piece and then turn the next page and then go through that process again. But um, we work with the partners to figure out how you want to experience that object because each scrapbook is so unique. And in many cases, they're very fragile because they're made up of all sorts of different types of materials and they're glue and ribbon. And yeah, it can get complicated, but, um, but they're so wonderful. So please nominate scrapbooks. Yeah, and that person followed up to say that the scrapbook in question was created by the County Farm Bureau Home Department, covering mm -hmm. two small farming communities in the 1930s. That's amazing. That sounds mm -hmm. great. Yeah, I, I love scrapbooks. They're kind of like the home movie of print materials. They're just, they're so special. Mm -hmm. um, are you encouraging nomination of local television programming? Much of this locally produced programming is mm -hmm. at, is lost or at risk. Yes, definitely. We've done a lot of new film collection, so that's been most of our experience. And in that case, um, you do you know need the permission. Ideally, you need the permission of the original um, production company or television station. And if the television station doesn't exist, that's a whole other challenge. Um, similar to kind of the how newspapers can change publishers' hands um, similar, similarly. But um, we've had partners that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet of news film. And the real challenge is, is selection. I mean, identification is one, one challenge, but then deciding what you want to do. So, and we've, we've had different discussions. Um, We've had a partner who goes by, you know, big names or events. Um, they know, you know, usually news films or news film collections are organized by date. So that's, that's one way of, of deciding what you want to do. And then others have gone with like their oldest programs. So we've, you know, there are different ways of, of selecting like what you want to start with. Um, but you definitely have to select because those collections tend to be enormous. But yes, they're definitely at risk. We've done a lot of, um, you know, television productions that were captured on film, um, you know, that were originally broadcast but captured on film. And then, of course, we've done video as well, lots of open reel video. So, yes, we're happy to take local television programs. And then do you digitize laser discs and LPs? We have done LPs. Laser discs we haven't done. We haven't, so this would kind of fall more into maybe our digital collection stream where we're taking existing digital collections. Um, laser discs are challenging because there's this interactive component. And we're getting into like born digital media territory, which we don't get a lot of. Um, we tend to focus more on the analog um, in terms of like migrating and digitization. But but I do recognize that, yeah, I, I can imagine there there's interesting content on laser discs, but we've never we've never gotten that. But I, I wouldn't discourage you from nominating a laser disc if it's if it's unique or rare. Excellent. And that's all the questions I'm seeing. Okay. I think we answered everybody's questions. Those are and good course, questions. Yeah, those are very interesting. And of course, I know you've given your contact information and you're yes. open to people contacting you. Oh, wait, let's see. We have someone indicating that he has one more question. Of course. So, We'll give him a we second have, to type. We have out. five minutes, so <laughs> I'm happy to stay. And, and if anyone has comments too, kind of about the challenges of digitization and how you've overcome them, I, I think we can all learn from each other's experience. And that's, that's what I'm missing from the workshop is having more discussion. So I'm happy to field any comments too. 
Okay, here we go. Uh, if you have microfilm reels, how is that digitized in terms of exhibitions? Mm -hmm. So what we end up doing is the digitization vendor will scan the whole reel and then, and we're also approximating what's on that reel because we, we have readers and, and we can go to that level of detail. Actually, if you have a reader um, and you can help us with identifying the number of issues and pages, that's really helpful, but we don't expect you to go to that level just because it's so time consuming. But what ends up happening is the vendor will scan the whole reel and then post-production, they'll pull those files um, into their software and it's all automatic. They end up cropping the pages. And then part of their QA, part of the vendor's QA, is identifying the dates for each issue on the newsreel. And then they'll add that metadata for us to distinguish the objects. And you know, they'll then create objects They'll parse, you know, individual objects from that reel. So in the end, we'll end up with hundreds of issues for that for that reel. And so there's a little bit of back and forth to answer your question. Like, you, what would end up happening is you would nominate that reel as its own object with that date range, the title and the date range, and then we would ask the vendor, you know, we'd give them a range of identifiers and ask them to match the issue date with each identifier and then in the end they would create these individual individual objects for each issue and we would get the metadata for each issue well those are great questions i'm really glad to hear about collections out there and i look forward to meeting you all and well i guess online for now but I hope to meet you in person, meet your collections, and and I hope everyone will participate, if not this year, maybe next year. Great. Thank you so much, Pamela. That was really excellent. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and thank you all for coming.